Hello? Oh, good morning. We're all waking up. I'm waking up. You're waking up. The microphone is waking up. Thank you so much for joining us for this excellent set of talks that we're about to see early in the day. Our first presenter is Arpit Gupta. He's a recent Princeton PhD grad. He's joining Columbia as a postdoc for this next year before starting on the faculty at UC Santa Barbara. He is recruiting students for next fall. So send your brightest students to work with him. Tell them that they wanna work with junior faculty. Junior faculty are great. And tell him about the awesome research that you're about to learn about called Sonata. All right. Thanks, Justine, for the introduction. So today I'll be presenting Sonata, a query-driven uh, streaming network telemetry system that is both flexible and scalable. So the onus of making the network is on network operators. However, in recent years, with the proliferation of internet-connected devices and applications, the complexity of network management has increased significantly. To keep the networks running, network operators have to handle various events, such as outages, congestion, and cyber attacks. And to handle all these events, the first thing they need to do is to detect these events, right? That is the need to perform network man monitoring. Now to uh, design, uh, to understand the requirements of a network monitoring system, let's consider a simple example. Here we have an attacker which sends spoof DNS request messages to open resolvers, and uh, the uh, response to these requests get reflected to the victims. And as the uh, number of responses increase, the victims get overwhelmed. Now, if I'm a network operator and if I want to figure out if hosts in my network are a victim of this attack or not, uh, I would like to uh, find out if there are hosts that receive DNS responses from many distinct sources, right? And notice in this task, the network operator is trying to extract an aggregate metric from a subset of the traffic. And there are so many ways in which uh, we can define what subset of traffic it is interested in and what kind of metric it wants to extract. So while designing network monitoring systems, it is very important that we uh, make sure that they are as flexible as possible. So now that we have established that network monitoring system need to be flexible, we need to understand that the amount of storage and compute resources available for these network monitoring systems is limited. And this creates a gap between desired flexibility and scalability. So in today's talk, I will present you a system Sonata that tries to bridge this gap. More concretely, I'll be talking about the abstractions that make it possible for network operators to uh, express wide range of network monitoring tasks and the algorithms that make the best use of limited uh, storage and compute resources. And of course, the system that glues the high-level abstraction with the uh, low-level algorithms. So as you can imagine, building a network monitoring system which is both flexible and scalable is going to be a very challenging task. The first challenge that we need to think about is what is the abstraction that we should expose to these programmers so that uh, they can uh, express wide range of uh, queries for mon uh, wide range of uh, network monitoring tasks. And uh, once we have provided this abstraction, we need to figure out how we're going to scale the queries uh, for these network monitoring tasks. Uh, so let's first talk about the programming abstraction. Uh, here, uh, a packet in a network carries a lot of information in its uh, package header as well as the payload field. But with recent developments in the programmable switch, uh, switches, uh, a packet also carries a lot of meta information, which captures the state of the network. Uh, for example, a packet carries information about what was the queue size that it observed or what were the hops it traversed in the network. So unlike many existing network monitoring systems that operate at much coarser level of granularity, Sonata operates at packet level of granularity. And it lets network operators uh, operate or use uh, or treat packet fields as tuples. And it also lets them uh, express their monitoring tasks as data, data flow queries. Let me try to unpack this with an example here. Uh, let's revisit the uh, example that we were talking about earlier. Here the network operator is trying to identify if the DNS response messages uh, from unique DNS servers to a single host exceed a threshold, right? Uh, let's try to see how network operator can express a query using data flow operators. So it is interested in finding uh, victim IP addresses and it will be operating over a stream of packet tuples. The first thing it will do is that it will uh, apply a filter operation so that we are only operating or looking at the stream of DNS responses. Then because it is interested in finding uh, the responses from unique DNS servers, 
So it will try to get, uh, uh, apply a map operator so that we have this pairs of destination IP and source IP. Then it will apply a distinct operator so that we have unique pairs of destination IP and source IP. And once we have that, it can replace the source IP with one and just apply a reduce operator so that now it has counts of uh, unique source IPs for each destination IP. And finally, once we have that number, we can just compare it with threshold to figure out uh, which are the IP addresses victim of this attack. So this is just one simple example uh, where we can express this high level network monitoring task using data flow queries, standard uh, data flow operators which are familiar to the network operators. And we observed that this was very helpful because we were able to express a wide range of network monitoring tasks in fewer than 20 lines of code. So now that we have allowed network operators to uh, operate at all packet fields and all packets in the network, uh, we have set ourselves against a very steep scalability challenge. So we have to figure out how we're going to execute uh, multiple queries for high volume traffic in real time, right? So now we have to figure out how we're going to scale the query execution, both as the number of queries and as well as the volume of traffic increases. To address this challenge, the first question that we need to address is, uh, what is the target that we are going to use for compiling or executing these queries? So in the past, all the network monitoring systems that offer this level of flexibility, they uh, use CPU for query execution. Now, CPUs are awesome because uh, you can extract or pass headers as well as payload fields. You can apply any action you want and the, uh, the stateful memory that is available for these stateful operators is of the order of gigabits. The problem is that uh, they process packets at order of microseconds, which is much slower. Now one can argue that uh, you can use uh, a state-of-art scalable stream processor to scale, horizontally scale the computation, uh, but the challenge is that the problem that they cannot process packets at line rate still holds true. And uh, if you want to lose them, we still need to capture packets from the data plane and then send to CPU for further processing. An alternate solution is that we can use uh, programmable switches. Uh, though these programmable switches can process packets at the uh, line rate, but they offer limit flexibility. Uh, they can, there's a limit on how many or how deep they can go and uh, how, what type of packet fields they can extract. The kind of operations they can perform on the packet are also limited. Uh, the state that, they, that is also available is of the order of megabits. Uh, please excuse me, I'll drink some water. All right. Not able to speak. Sorry. <laughs> so, uh, as as I was saying, that uh, in contrast, we can use programmable switches because uh, uh, they they can process packets at line rate. However, they offer limited flexibility because there is a limit on how deep you can go and you can uh, what kind of packet fields you can extract. And also, the uh, operated operators or operations that they can uh, they support is also limited. And uh, plus, the amount of stateful memory that is available is also very limited. So rather than focusing on uh, choosing just one type of device for executing queries, we started exploring can we use both switches and CPU for query execution, right? And uh, before I talk about how we can use these programmable switches for query execution, let me give you a brief overview of uh, packet processing model for PISA targets. So devices that are based on PISA, which is a protocol independent switch architecture, they have a programmable parser. So this programmable parser can extract user-defined packet formats and store the parse value in a fixed length packet header vector. And a, a switch will have a pipeline with multiple stages. Each stage will have multiple reconfigurable match action tables composed of these TCAMs, ALUs, and SRAMs. And a pipeline will have multiple such stages. At the end of the pipeline, we will have a deparser that will serialize this packet header vector back into a packet. So given this background of like how packet processing is done in these programmable switches, let me try to uh, uh, make up argument that this is not very different from data flow processing model, which is inherent to stream processors. So both these uh, uh, processing models, uh, you can represent them as pipelines of processing units that operate over some structured data. 
and uh, this uh, the processing unit in case of data flow is going to be operators such as map, reduce, this thing. And in case of data plane, these are match action table. And the structured data that we're talking about for data flow is tuples, and for the data plane, it's packets. Now it is straightforward to reason how we can represent packets as tuples, but how we can translate these data flow operators as match action tables is not so straightforward. So let me try to unpack that with some examples. Let's talk about uh, states less operator such as filter, right? Filter will have a predicate P, it receives the stream of elements and it will uh, output a stream of element after applying this predicate P, right? Uh, this operator can be simply translated by supplying this predicate P to the match field of the match action table. More concretely, for the query that we were discussing earlier, uh, here the filter, the predicate for this filter is an exact match on UDP source code, which can be implemented as shown here. So this is the case for stateless operator. We can implement map operator in a similar fashion. Let's talk about the stateful operator. Let's talk about reduce, which applies a function L. So it receives this uh, stream of elements and it returns a single output value, which, after, which is received after applying this function F over all these elements, right? And because this is stateful, it will require some memory. Now this memory can be implemented in the hardware switch as hash index array, right? And to execute or to compile this operator, we will require two match action tables. So talking about the re reduce operator that we have here, uh, we will require now two match action tables. The first match action table will use the packet fields to compute the hash index, and the second match action table will apply this function f, which is the sum in this case, right? So now that we understand that we can uh, uh, compile, or how we can translate an uh, individual operator into a series of match action tables, compiling a query is relatively straightforward. We can just uh, apply all these match action, individual match action tables in sequence. Uh, in this case, uh, what I'm showing you is the D1 and D2, and R1 and R2 are basically the two match action tables that are required for stateful operators distinct and reduce, right? So now we understand that how a query can be compiled as match action tables in over a switch, or we understand how it compiles over a stream processor using CPU, right? But we need to understand that the amount of resources that are available over a switch are limited. Thus the system actually requires a query planner which is going to make decisions about which portion of this query should be executed over the switch and which portion of the query should be executed over CPU. And after applying the processing over the switch, the remainder tuples will be sent to the CPU for further processing. And there are so many decisions this query planner can actually make, uh, but for each decision, it needs to answer two basic questions. The first question being that whether the switch has sufficient resources to execute the partition query. And second question is, whether the decision, the partitioning decision is reducing the workload or the number of tuples that are sent to the stream processor, right? And you, you will say that I'm overcomplicating this problem. This is a very straightforward uh, question to answer if you just have one query. But in practice, the system will not have just one query. There will be so many queries here, right? And this problem will get more complicated because we have to make decisions, partitioning decisions for all these queries which will be sharing the data plane resource. So what we did was that we modeled this query partitioning problem as an integer linear program. The goal of this ILP is that we want to minimize the number of tuples that are sent to the stream processor. And this is subject to data plane constraints. And the data plane constraints being, what is the size of the packet header vector? Uh, what are the number of actions that can be performed in each stage? What is the amount of persistent state for stateful operators available in each state? In each stage, and what are the total number of stages, right? And we use uh, representative packet traces to estimate what are the resource requirement for individual match action tables, and also what is the estimate of like number of tuples that will be sent to the stream processor. So now that we understand how query planner is going to make the partitioning decisions, it's going to solve this uh, partitioning problem, uh, let's try to understand how effective this approach is. So what I'm showing you here on y-axis is the number of tuples that are sent to the stream processor. And uh, we are showing, I'm showing you results for an experiment where we considered eight different monitoring tasks and the workload was 100 GBPS. So if I'm sending everything to CPU, not doing anything in the switch, the number of tuples will be order of billion for a CPU. Now, intuition is that if we can execute the stateful operators in the switch itself, then we should expect multiple orders of magnitude reduction in the tuples that are sent to the stream processor. However, in practice, we observed that the order of reduction was just one. 
and we this was kind of confusing for us and we started exploring like why are we not observing the reduction as we were expecting and after some exploration we observed that we were not getting the results as expected because the amount of stateful memory that was required for executing these operators such as distinct and reduce was more than what was available in the switch so the query partitioning or query planner was forced there to execute all these stateful operators in the cpu rather than the switch and that is why we were sent, like we were observing that uh, the number of tuples that the stream processor was high so we started exploring that is there any way in which we can reduce the memory footprint of these stateful operators and to answer this question we made a couple of observations that helped us uh, one observation was regarding the nature of monitoring task for example the query that we discussed earlier the number of uh, hosts that will be victim of a dns reflection attack is going to be a very very small fraction of the total number of hosts in the network right in a way we were trying to find needles in a haystack and we noted that this observation is actually true for most of the network monitoring tasks that we were looking at and this inspired us to explore a technique in which we can uh, only uh, spend these uh, limited resources on portion of traffic that is going to satisfy the task the other observation was that uh, we observed that with simple transformations to the existing queries it is actually possible to reduce their memory footprint for example for this given query if i apply a map operator which says like you know just consider 8 bits of the destination ip field and then execute the query as is so with this transformation what we are doing is that we are executing this query at a coarser refinement level but if we are just considering 8 bits of the destination ip field then the stateful operators such as distinct and reduce will require lesser memory so the the message is that we can reduce the memory footprint of a query if we execute at coarser level so now you must be wondering about what about the accuracy of the query uh, whether it will find the needles that we were interested in or whether it will miss it right for that we made additional observation which was that if the fields that we use for this refinement they have hierarchical structure then we will not be missing the needles that we were interested in in a way that it is possible to preserve the accuracy of the query if we are using the fields which are hierarchical and luckily for most of the queries that we had the fields which were used for these stateful operators were destination ip or source ip which have hierarchical structure so we combined all these observations together to devise this scheme called iterative query refinement what we do in this scheme is that we first execute the query at coarser refinement level that is we will transform the query we will apply a map operator say that we will only consider say for example first 8 bits and then at the end of this first window interval we will uh, get the output which will have the queries because of the choice of hierarchical packet field will have the needles that we were interested in but it will have some false positives also because uh, we are operating at coarser level now once we have that what we do is like for new fresh set of packets that are coming in a new window interval we will apply the same query but at finer level but this time we will be applying a filter operator which will make sure that it will only operate over subset of traffic that satisfied the query in the previous interval right so now we will apply all these similar set of operators at finer refinement level note that the effective memory footprint over these two intervals has reduced but the cost is that it is taking additional time for finding the needles that we were interested in right so in a way at this high level the iterative query refinement approach is uh, able to reduce the memory footprint for executing these queries in the switch but the cost is that it takes additional time to find the needles that we were interested in so now that we understand at a high level how iterative query refinement works let's think let's try to understand how query planner makes these uh, refinement decisions so for the query planner the goal is still the same that it wants to minimize the number of tuples that are sent to the stream processor uh, it is given the set of queries and the representative packet traces in addition to the standard decision making that it was doing for query partitioning it needs to answer few additional questions one is that which packet field should it use for uh, iterative refinement there can be multiple candidates and it also has to make sure that they have hierarchical structure not all queries will have it so not all queries will benefit from this approach also but given the query it will figure out which uh, packet field is right for iterative refinement then what levels to use for iterative refinement right so in the example that i was talking about we were saying that we will first consider 8 bits and then the 32 bits but that 
approach might work for one query. For a different query, different set of refinement levels will work. So the query planner needs to figure out what set of levels to use for iterative refinement for each given query. And finally, once it has figured out what levels to use, it still needs to make decisions on partitioning, right? For each of those refined queries, it needs to decide which part of that query will be executed in the switch and which part of the query will be executed in the CPU. So what we did here was that we augmented the existing partitioning ILP and added all these questions or modeled all these questions into that ILP so that ILP can make decisions about what refinement levels to use and how to partition each of those queries. So now that we understand at a high level uh, how query planner is making decisions about refinement and partitioning, let's understand what is the performance improvement here. So now, uh, compared to uh, this, the approach where we were sending everything to CPU, when we were doing partitioning, we were just getting one order of magnitude improvement. But with partitioning as well as refinement combined together, we are able to get four orders of magnitude reduction. So let me try to summarize this talk and tell you what the key takeaways from this talk are. We designed and implemented a system which is flexible. Uh, it uses uh, or it lets network operators express queries for a wide range of network monitoring tasks, and it lets them express those queries as data flow queries over packet tuples. And uh, we expressed or tried to express uh, queries for a wide range of network monitoring tasks, which required less than 20 lines of code. The system is scalable. What it does is that uh, it makes uh, best use of limited resources of both programmable switches as well as the CPU. And it uses these query refinement and partitioning algorithms to reduce the workload by four orders of magnitude. So Sonata is step in the right direction, but it also lays foundation for much future work. So one of the future directions that we are currently exploring is uh, being able to monitor network-wide events. So the current implementation of Sonata is only able to identify network events at a single location, and we are currently working on how we can extend that so that we can identify network-wide events. The other thing is that Sonata, though, is capable of handling traffic dynamics uh, by uh, looking at the collisions and reacting to it. But uh, we are looking at approaches in which we can make this, this uh, reactive or adaptive, like make the system more adaptive by figuring out efficient ways in which one, we can identify whether the traffic patterns have changed and also come up with new or efficient recomputation and reconfiguration techniques so that we can update the packet processing pipeline. We have made the codes, uh, we have made the code for this uh, project publicly available and we hope that there will be some follow-up code in the future. So with that, I'll end the talk and I'll be more than happy to take questions. Thank you. I'm Alex Tal from Huawei. So first comment about RMT. Actually, it was invented in 2001 by Accelerated. So I don't understand when everybody showing a uh, uh, programmable pipeline and they call it from 2013. It was a 2001 Accelerated architecture. Now a comment about uh, switches or a question. So usually switches, they're doing some things, okay? They're forwarding, they have tables, their code space because the switches are high end, they a lot, have a lot of optimization on area, and their tables are populated, their code space is not enough, and they have to forward packets of line work. So have you, have you considered a case when the switch is already doing something? So yes, we have definitely considered that switches are not just for network monitoring, and uh, the system is kind of modular that it takes into consideration what is the amount of resources that are available for network monitoring. So if you have provisioned more resources for network monitoring, it will be able to do more operations in the switch. If that's not the case, then most more things will be sent to the stream processor. So it's kind of like a uh, flexible design in which you can choose that how much workload you, can, you want to send to the stream processor and provision things yeah, accordingly. So, so t t taking from practice, usually the switches are so, so much populated, maybe there's like 10% of extra headroom, right? So, so, so taking a real uh, system, does it for 10% make sense, uh, even trying to saying, okay, I will do something with these switches, so I just will send it to the host and they, they will do the rest of the work? So uh, that's a fair question. I think like uh, it depends on what kind of target or switch you're using and what kind of resources are available. So there are different varieties of targets that are available. In our evaluation, what we did was we showed the performance of the system for different configuration of targets. So 
10%, I don't know what it translates to, but we showed different configuration. I mean, showed like if we have lesser amount of resources available for the same settings, what is the workload on the stream process? Okay, thank you. No worries. Itan from Eranox. Uh, did you consider partitioning the queries also to the Nix or Smart Nix? Uh? So yes, uh, we definitely considered that. And uh, so one thing is that the system is extensible. So the, uh, the architecture that we have is like, we have data plane drivers. So currently we have written for the Tofino switches or other people behavioral model switches, software switches, but uh, the driver can be extended so that you, you can kind of like use uh, SmartNICs also for that. One reason that why we kind of like didn't explore that further was that we were more interested in supporting stateful operators. So we observed at least at the time when we were exploring this project, like stateful operators were not supported in some of the NICs that we had. So that's one reason why we didn't explore it further. Okay, thank you. Let's thank our speaker. Thank you. So our next presenter is Louis Pedroza. He's from EPFL, he's a postdoc. He just finished his PhD at USC, and he's on the job market this year. So he's gonna tell us about some really interesting work that he's doing at the intersection of programming languages and networking to tackle one of the scary problems that people have been concerned about in network functions and whether or not network functions are likely targets for attack. Um, so as you're watching this, consider, do you wanna interview him? Do you want to hire him? It's gonna be a great talk. It's one of my favorite papers of the conference. So uh, with that, I'll let you go. Thanks, Justine. Uh, just a moment while we figure out projection. wonders of modern projection. We can solve a lot of things in networking, but we cannot, we cannot yet solve the problem of immediately projecting the moment you get up to the podium. Again. Thanks, Justine, for the kind introduction. Um, I'm Louis Pedrosa. I came here from EPFL in Switzerland. And today I'll be talking to you about our recent work in automatically generating adversarial workloads. Um, 
So I'm pretty much preaching to the choir with this audience, but we all know the advantages and disadvantages of software networking. On the plus side, we have all the advantages of the software development cycle. More flexibility, decreased time to market, and decreased cost. But this also comes at the expense of the typical problems of software. The increased likelihood of bugs. And also, the harder problem of inconsistent performance of running software on commodity hardware. This has real world consequences. Um, as an adversary can create carefully uh, designed traffic that will slow down network functions, that, and this can lead to denial of service attacks and slow down the network. So clearly, we need better tools. Currently, what, what we commonly use today is a form of dynamic analysis known as profiling. In this analysis, we take our known test case inputs, and hopefully we do have test case inputs that lead to poor performance. Given these specific uh, traffic patterns, we can then <coughs> we can analyze the code and see exactly where the cycles are being spent, which instructions are hotter, and all of that. But this analysis can only help you if you know the specific inputs, at which point it will help you find the root cause and debug the issue. It cannot help you find the inputs that will lead to bad performance. If you want to do that, you need to use some form of static analysis. These kinds of analyses can reason more broadly about how performance works for all inputs. And within this kind of analysis, there are two subcategories. One is what we call an over-approximating analysis. This is a, um, a kind of analysis that can reason more broadly about all scenarios, even some scenarios that don't exist. So traffic patterns that may not exist, but it can, it's particularly useful for finding bounds. It can reason about performance as a fo in a formal way, and so you have a specific bound that you cannot surpass. On a scale here that I'm showing, uh, of latency, if you have a network function that can hypothetically have a latency between zero on the left and a hypothetical maximum for any traffic pattern at the max on the right, what we're looking at, what we'll be seeing here would be a worst case execution time bound, which would be uh, slightly to the right of that. Now we don't know how tight those bounds are, but we do know that we can never surpass that. But the problem is, there may be no actual workload that leads to that bound, and so we don't have anything that can help us debug the problem. Now, on the other hand, we also have under-approximating analyses. These analyses are specifically designed that they can only look at that which can lead to a specific workload. And so they're always within the zero to max region. These are the kind of analyses that we'll be looking at today, and they generate adversarial inputs, which will hopefully be as close as possible to the maximum, but still within the feasible realm. And in practice, uh, what we see is that they're pretty close. The ones that we come up with are pretty close to what we think are the maximum. And so, now that we're more or less on the same page on what the problem I'm trying to solve here is, I suggest we, um, I propose Kasten. Kasten is our tool for finding, automatically finding adversarial workloads. It stands for Cycle Approximating Symbolic Timing Analysis for Network Functions. As a static analysis, it takes as input the code of the network function itself and generates a PCAP file with the adversarial workload. So you can then use this PCAP file with a profiler or any other existing tools to debug your performance issue and hopefully fix it. Kasten generates these workloads by exploiting two very important sources of performance variability in modern hardware, or running, of running software on commodity hardware. The CPU cache hierarchy, which uh, has variability between L1 hits and DRAM accesses, and algorithm complexity, where Certain, uh, certain packets can have longer uh, instruction paths. And in the end, it actually works. For one particular network function, we were able to increase latency by 3x. So, now that we're all on the same page, during the rest of the presentation, I'll describe how Kasten works in a bit more detail. I'll start by sim uh, describing symbolic execution, the underlying technique that Kasten is built on. I'll then go into more detail about how Kasten uses symbolic execution to generate adversarial workloads. Once we all understand how that works, I will evaluate Kasten and show how the adversarial workload that we generated measure up. I will then wrap everything up with some final thoughts. Let's get started. Symbolic execution is a, a special technique. It's been around for nearly 40 years now. And I'm pretty sure that most people here in the audience are quite familiar with it, but just in case, I'll go over it uh, very quickly. Symbolic execution is a kind of code interpreter that uses a very special uh, interpreter that modifies the way it, it runs the code. 
as it feeds values into the code, instead of assigning inputs a specific value, say zero or one, it assigns it a symbol. In the example I'm showing here on line one, when we assign a val uh, an input to the variable var, instead of assigning it a number, we assign it the symbol alpha, which represents any possible value. On line number two, when we increment that variable, it becomes alpha plus one for whatever value that may be, and that's the value we would return. This is easy to understand so far, but what happens when you hit a branch instruction, say an if, like what I'm highlighting right here? We don't know this, the value of that symbol, so we don't know which branch to take. Well, in that case, you fork execution and you take both branches. As this happens, you keep track of the constraints, the arithmetical constraints on the symbols that must hold for each of the branches to be followed, and we use a solver to, sec if, to, uh, we use a solver to check if those constraints are satisfiable and only explore the, uh, the branches that are feasible. In the end, we can take these constraints and feed them again into a solver, this time to find concrete values that will make the execution path go through the branches that we were exploring. In this case here, uh, we find that uh, if, you if you set the input to say zero, it will go through the true branch. And so now you have a, a concrete way of exercising that. So anyone here who's paying attention would notice this, this is not scalable. The number of paths that you're generating can be, in many cases, exponential based on the number of branches. Actually, in the presence of uh, loops, that number is unbounded. This is known as path explosion. It's a very big problem in this field. What this basically tells us is that it, it is impractical to use symbolic execution exhaustively, at least on, uh, at least on unmodified trivial, uh, and non-trivial code. Well, what do you do when you have a lot of work to do and you don't have enough time for it all? You prioritize. In that case, or in, in this case here, that's known as directed symbolic execution. You prioritize executing some paths over others based on some heuristic. Ultimately, we can reduce this down to a form of uh, graph search and use a heuristic in, during the search to lean the symbolic execution towards finding paths that are more relevant. Most commonly, that means finding bugs or increasing coverage when you're generating a, a test tree. Ultimately, the analysis does not terminate. And so you just let it run indefinitely and it produces results over time. Eventually, when you're satisfied with the results or you just run out of time or patience, you press control C and you have a set of results that it's produced so far. Okay, we're all on the same page on, on symbolic execution. Let's get back to Kasten. So the point of Kasten is that it needs to find a sequence of packets that leads to more CPU cycles per packet. That's what we're calling an adversarial workload. The analysis needs to be able to always find a, a, a sequence of packets and so it's an under approximation. It cannot uh, formally um, produce bounds. What we're trying to find is an adversarial workload that is as bad as we can get, but not necessarily the worst one. And then the analysis is largely automated. We try to do this with as little, if any, developer input other than the code itself. So Kasten does this by attacking on three different fronts. On one hand, we look at the CPU cache hierarchy and what this does is it's trying to increase the number of DRAM accesses, which leads to an increased number of cycles per instruction. We also look at algorithmic complexity, in which case we're trying to increase the number of instructions per packet. Finally, hash functions are a particular challenge and we have some special treatment for that. So we can reverse, uh, we can reverse the hash functions and expose data structure internals to then attack those using the 3v2 techniques. Let's look at these one by one. So attacking the CPU cache is something that comes up whenever we have what we call symbolic pointers. This comes up whenever you index memory with something that is based on a part of the packet. Or as I have here in this example, you're indexing an array with, for example, the IPv4 destination address of the packet. When this happens, we need to find a sequence of packets that leads to a sequence of memory access, a memory access pattern, which will persistently access DRAM. And that definitely slows everything down. To do this, we created a CPU cache model that describes how the cache works under all of the different scenarios that we care about. The model is fairly simple. We did not need to make a very complex model for the sake of, uh, of Kasten. It's just a single one-tier model that just models the last level uh, cache. It models contention, associativity, and writeback. Due to um, CPU cache slicing and the proprietary hash function behind that, 
we do not have a, uh, an algebraic model, so we use an empirical model based on actual cache measurements that lets us understand how contention works, even despite not having full information about the processor. Now, as for algorithmic complexity, well, in this case, what we're trying to do is find a sequence of packets that leads to longer code paths. This is where we use that directed symbolic execution I mentioned earlier. Well, ultimately what we're trying to do is we're creating a heuristic to try to guide symbolic execution towards paths that increase the number of cycles per packet, all without inducing a breadth-first search. Now, to estimate the number of cycles per packet, we look at, an, at, at a specific execution state, and we have to estimate the cycles for that one state. So we're looking at the number of cycles between receiving a packet and receiving the subsequent packet. We can add up the number of cycles up to the point where we are right now. That's easy. We already know the number of the exact instructions up to that point. We just tally up the cycles so far while using the cache model to account for cache hits and misses. But from that point on to the point of receiving the next packet, it's a bit more difficult. There are potentially many paths. So what we have to do is estimate the cost, the number of cycles of the longest path from that point onward. And this estimate has to be done fairly carefully. If we under approximate, we get a weaker adversarial workload. But if we over approximate, it will lead to a breadth first search, which will grind the analysis to a halt. Let's see how this works. So we do a very simple control flow uh, graph analysis. Um, and I'll walk you through an example uh, right here on the, on the presentation. What you have here is a very simple control flow graph for an if statement. You'll notice that the control flow diverges at one point and then converges again later on before reaching the target instruction in black, which is the point where we would receive the next packet. You'll also notice that one of the branches is slightly longer than the other one. So we start by initializing the cost of each of these instructions to minus infinity and the cost of the target to zero. And the idea is that we want to back propagate the costs of each instruction uh, backwards along the graph. In this example, uh, I will be making the cost of each node one, but in real life, we estimate the number of cycles for each instruction that these nodes represent. So, as we work backwards from the, the target node, we end up with uh, this point, this intermediate point here. The node I'm highlighting, though, has two successors. So, which of the two successors do we take when we are adding our cost to, the, uh, to its cost? We take the largest of the two, so we'll take the cost of the node costing three, add one to it, and continue the backpropagation. As the symbolic execution engine walks through this part of the code, it will see that the cost of going through the longer path is more advantageous and will follow through with that. And so we'll explore the longer path. In the presence of loops, this is a bit more difficult. I have, um, I'm going to show you a new example now with a loop. You'll notice that the edges in this graph are slightly different. So this actually represents a loop instead of an if statement. As before, we initialize the cost to minus infinity. If we just follow through with our previous algorithm somewhat naively, well, we end up with something that looks like this. So far, so good, but if you look at the node I'm highlighting, it does have a successor that costs more, so hypothetically, we would continue backpropagating. This would lead to a count to infinity problem, which would fill the entire graph with infinities, which leads to breadth first search. Clearly, we cannot do that. So we would have to use a di um, distance vector algorithm to prevent the loop from unraveling. If you, and that's pretty much what I'm showing you right here. But if you do that, you'll notice the cost of, uh, the estimated cost before getting into the loop is actually cheaper than the cost within the loop itself. That makes no sense. We are underestimating the loop and we're completely uh, cutting out the loop body. So this is a problem. So to solve that, we modify the distance vector algorithm so that we allow the instructions to show up at, uh, at most twice. This unrolls the loop once and so now the cost of the loop becomes internalized ex before its, uh, its presence. As we use symbolic execution engine at this point, it will walk through the loop, and when it reaches the loop guard instruction, where it, can, it faces a choice of either going further into the loop or exiting, it will notice that the cost of going into the loop is more advantageous, at which point it will greedily try to unroll the loop, unroll the loop as much as possible. Eventually, the, the loop will reach its end and the execution will continue forward. The final front that we, ha uh, that we attack on is hash functions. Hash functions pose a particular challenge in symbolic execution. If you directly try to symbolically execute them, it generates very complex expressions and in some cases, path explosions. 
And yet, this is, a, this is a common construct. Network functions, we need to be able to reason about the hash value that is computed by the hash function, but we cannot compute it. How do we handle that? We use a technique called halving. This technique is based on the idea that you can um, annotate and disable the part of the code that we cannot handle. In this case, we remove the hash function and we keep track of where its inputs and outputs come from and go to. Once we know where the hash value is stored, we can overwrite it with an unmodified, unconstrained symbol. Now that we have an unconstrained symbol for the hash value, we can continue symbolic execution unhindered by the complexity of the hash function itself. But now we have divorced the hash value from the packet itself, so we have a new challenge. We have to find a sequence of packets that leads to a sequence of hash values that leads to the expected behavior that we're looking at. So let's see how we can solve that. So in a traditional network function, you start from the packet and you extract from the packet a part of the packet that will be used as the input to the hash function. And then you, you use the hash function itself to compute the hash from that, and that will potentially lead to uh, poor performance. Yet, we have divorced the hash inputs from the hash values, so we can no longer use a solver to connect all of these things all at once. So what we do, we solve them one by one in reverse. Once we have the path that we expect to have for performance, we use the solver to find hash values that lead to that poor performance. Now that we have the hash values, we use rainbow tables to efficiently reverse the hash function without actually having computed it, and um, we find inputs to the hash function that will eventually lead to the poor performance. Now that we have the inputs to the hash function, we add constraints to the, uh, to the path constraint saying the symbolic expression for those inputs is equal to these values. We again use the solver and now we can find packets that will follow through the entire pipeline to generate the bad behavior. So, now that we all understand how Kastan works, let's see how the actual adversarial workloads it generates measure up. To evaluate Kastan, we used a, a simple test bed, two standard Intel Xeon servers with 10 GB NICs. We had a tester device which generated traffic using MoonGen and got, used hardware time stamping for very precise measurements, and a device under test, DUT, where we run the actual network function. We used 11 different network functions that fall within three different types. We have a, net, a network address translation system, a load balancer, and a longest DTIP match router. For each of these kinds of uh, network functions, we re-implemented them with different data structures that have a different um, performance profile. In the interest of time, I'll only sh uh, be talking about results of these two specific ones here, um, NAT with an unbalanced tree, which demonstrates an algorithmic, complex an algorithmic complexity attack, and uh, an LTM that is, uh, with a single lookup table, which demonstrates a cache attack. I have backup slides with all the other ones in case anyone is interested. For each of these network functions, we used several different scenarios for comparison. As a baseline, we have a special NOT network function that just forwards packets. This is our baseline so that we can extract the cost, the, the baseline cost of measurement itself. We then have the adversarial workloads. First, the one generated by Kasten itself. These are about 50 flows, depending on the network function. And um, in some cases, we have a manual workload that was devised by an engineer based on human intuition. We then have random workloads. We start with the uniform random workload where we have one million flows uniformly, uh, um, uniformly randomly uh, distributed across the, the flow space. This is what typically is considered an adversarial workload today, and it's what you'll also find in many denial of service attacks. We also have a Zipfin distribution workload with about 7,000 flows. This represents um, modern power law um, internet traffic. Finally, we created a special case of uniform random, but with the same number of flows as Kasten, so that we can have an apples to apples comparison. Let's have a look at the first result. This is our longest prefix match uh, network function with a single lookup table. This is a simple network function that takes a part of the, the IPv4 address and uses it to directly access memory. It's clearly susceptible to a cache attack. And that's what we see here. On this, uh, I'm showing you a, C a CDF plot. On the x-axis, we have the latency of network function measured in nanoseconds, and on the y-axis, we have the CDF itself. The black line on the left is our baseline, the cost of doing nothing, and everything else should be measured in relation to that. All these lines here in the middle represent our typical internet traffic, including our Zipkin workload. And on the right, you'll see 
the adversarial workloads, both the Kasten one and the uniform random one. But when you take uniform random and put the same number of flows that Kasten has, barely shows up on the map, it's the same as, as your standard traffic. The key takeaway is, well, Kasten was actually able to induce a persistent VRAM access pattern, which was able to increase latency by a factor of three. This was about the same as uniform random, which is what we would expect to be the worst case scenario for this network function, but uniform random uses one million flows and Kasten uses 50. Even when we, have to, when we force uniform random to use the same number of flows as Kasten, it barely makes a difference. This also has an effect on throughput, as, as you can see here, Kasten drops throughput compared to traditional internet traffic by 19%. So now let's have a look at the NAT box using an unbalanced tree. Now I think we can all agree that an unbalanced tree is an unoptimized data structure that no one should be using in production. But sometimes bad code makes it to production, wouldn't be the first time, and it's nice to have a tool that helps you understand what happens and so you can solve and uh, you can debug and fix it. Again, this is a CDF, the x-axis is the latency and the y-axis is the distribution. The black line on the left is our not. What we see here is that there's a, a, the performance doesn't depend just on whether the traffic is adversarial or not, but also on the sheer volume of traffic. And the, the uniform random is way to the right just because it has one million flows. But the Zipkin traffic workload is still slightly to the left even though it has 7,000 flows. The unit, the, the, the Kasten workload, which has about 50 flows, is doing about the same as a manual one which we carefully crafted to skew the tree. And this is despite having two orders of magnitude fewer flows than uh, the, the Zipkin workload. The takeaway here is, yes, Kasten, even in these specific scenarios, was able to find a pattern that skewed the tree very specifically, and that this increases la median latency by 70%. The throughput in this case was modified to a lesser degree, only by 7%, but it was able to come up with a pattern that was pretty close to the manual workload. And the manual workload requires an engineer to devote some time and, and pay their attention and learn how the network function works, use their intuition. Kasten does this automatically without developer input. With that, I conclude my talk. Today I talked to you about Kasten, our system that automatically generates adversarial workloads. It does this by attacking algorithmic complexity, the CPU cache hierarchy, and by carefully um, reversing hash functions to expose data, stru data structure internally. It does this with little, if any, developer input. The adversarial workloads that we come up with are about the same as manual, but without requiring human intuition, and they do far better than uniform random when compared to, with the same number of flows. In one case, we increased latency by 201% and dropped throughput by 19%. I'm, if you're interested in finding out more, I encourage you to uh, seek this out. We have a poster downstairs in case anyone is interested, and all of the resources regarding this, the paper, the poster, and the source code are all available online on the link that I'm posting up here. Thank you very much, I'm happy to take your questions. Hi, Marco Fellini from Kaust. Uh, thanks for the wonderful presentation. So the work is very interesting, and you convey quite nicely, you know, um, the high level uh, in the work uh, for symbolic execution. But I'm trying to develop a little bit more intuition as to why Kasten would uh, want to produce more than one one single flow. So if you think about network functions, um, much of the code. If it is doing flow-based uh, uh, analysis, it would, you know, ask the question: Is this packet belonging to an existing flow, or is it packet uh, belonging mm -hmm. to a new flow? Right. So there is this uh, branch point in the code, and subsequent to that, uh, you know, much of it will be uniform. So uh, you were showing this adversarial workload with, uh, you said, 50 flows, but I don't quite understand, you know, how you would come up with those 50 flows. Uh, given that what you're trying to produce is, uh, is a path that has a higher cost. Right. Um, so, my apologies, I meant 50 packets. Kasten itself does not have the notion of a flow. Um, it's, it's something that emerges, and we just measure the number of flows from the PCAP file that, that it produces. Uh, we, as we run Kasten, we tell it how many packets we want it to run. Essentially, we, when I mentioned that we run the analysis indefinitely and press Control C, there is a parameter to Kasten that says, uh, you can stop at X packets, and that's what the PCAP file will have. All right, thanks. Hi, uh, 
the time and cost of using for free. Um, I wanted to ask in the evaluation, you said that uh, you, the main um, impact is the more DRAM access. So I wanted to ask whether this is due to additional instructions or uh, more like uh, additional cache misses. So DRAM accesses is the most expensive of these, yes. Um, and that does not infect the number of instructions. It's a single instruction, typically a read instruction or a load instruction, which will have significantly more cycles due to the DRAM access than if it were an L1 hit or any so, other kind of hit. So, so most of the um, uh, effect of, uh, of Kastan is uh, cache misses, causing cache misses, like the, the adversarial uh, uh, workload that you create. Does it, cause, does it cause more cache misses or does it cause more uh, like longer executions? Kastan tries to do both, and depending on the structure of network function, one or the other. No, but what, what did you find like in, in reality in your experiments? That's interesting. It works for all of those, and different network functions have different cases. The DRAM accesses have the highest costs because it's just, it's the one case where you can have something like 3x. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Take one more question while we're setting up here. Hey, uh, Sanjay from uh, Purdue. Uh, I enjoyed your talk. Um, so a question for me was, um, is there anything specific to the networking domain that you're exploiting to make this work? And if so, what? Or, why, or is this more generally applicable, uh, the techniques that you have developed? Thank you. That's a very interesting question. The technique overall is not specific to networking, but it takes advantage of several factors that are common in networking. The technique does not scale to extremely large programs, so you wouldn't run this on, say, a MapReduce. But because it's exploiting these low-level features that have such an, an important factor on network functions, because they run typically with a very small time uh, budget, 150 nanoseconds or so, uh, uh, that's where it's most advantageous. We also take advantage of the fact that networking has a very specific structure to its inputs. We know exactly inputs come from packets, and they only come in through the receive function, and it's very well-structured code, and so it makes the analysis much easier to automate. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Let's thank Louise. Our next speaker is Kai Gao. He just graduated from Tsinghua University. He also has a new job. Where are you headed? Uh, Tsinghua University. Ah, congratulations. Thank you very much. He's going to talk to us about Trident, which is a unified SDN programming framework. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, Good morning, everyone. My name is Kai, and I'm, it's my great honor to be here and present Trident toward a unified SDN programming framework with automatic updates. This is also a joint work with my collaborators, Tashi Nojima and Richard Young. Taking the control plane out of distributed boxes, SDN simplifies network management, management with logically centralized network control. At the same time, a lot of network functions are also deployed in the network after analyzing the traffic, they can extract useful information such as uh, whether this uh, host is a heavy hitter or what is the joint location of the host. These informations are layer saving information. <laughs> and combining these two te technologies into a unified um, programming framework, we might be able to enable adaptive and cross-layer network control. So a, program, a network program can react dynamically to the characteristics of the traffic and also control the traffic based on layer two to layer seven information. As we refer to it as unified SDN programming. So in the talk today, I want to talk about what are the design challenges of a unified SDN programming framework and why are existing SDN uh, programming frameworks not sufficient to do the job. So the first challenge is how to integrate network function state into SDN programming because the state-of-the-art SDN programming languages support layer two to layer four programming very naturally because all these information are contained in every single packet. However, for network function states, as we discussed earlier, they are like layer seven information which are not contained in packet header fields. And for, uh, for example, the HTTP host information, before you establish, establish the HTTP, uh, before you exchange the hello, uh, before you finish the handshake of HTTP protocol, you do not have the information about whether the packet belongs to a certain HTTP request. So there can be inf unknown information, and because they are modeled as state machines, they could constantly be updated by the state machines. So we need a simple abstraction to encode these layer state information into SDN programming. 
And the second challenge is to construct consistently and accurately routes. Uh, the problem is that a lot of network functions require a certain uh, symmetry requirement in the, about the traffic because, for example, the deep packet inspection, they probably require the packets from, for HTTP connection to go to the same instance. And without uh, the ability to describe such correlations, people are, might define the routing for the packets in both flows independently, and that can cause a problem because, uh, for example, in the uh, example we demonstrate on the right-hand side, uh, the forward pass, basically the red one, goes from the host to DPI node one and then to the internet. But if the return shortest pass is calculated also using the shortest pass algorithm, then it might choose the blue pass, and the consequence is that they, they do not go through the same DPI node, and the DPI node cannot work correctly. So we need to systematically construct these consistent and correlated routes. And to address the aforementioned challenges, uh, Trident comes up with two programming uh, abstractions, basically the stream attribute and also the route algebra. Uh, the stream attribute is to encode network function state as if they are like header fields so that programmers can select packets based on these attributes. And the route algebra is a simple yet flexible abstraction to systematically construct consistent and correlated routes. Uh, after them, people might think that, okay, we have very simple abstractions to do the match and action for this unified SDM programming framework. However, there's still another problem that we have to handle dynamicities caused by network functions. Because a lot of network function states are dynamic. So when the state of finite state machine change, the corresponding route may also have to change. And if we want to identify all these uh, dependencies to handle this dynamicity manually, it can be very complex and error prone. So in order to solve that problem, I try to introduce the abstraction of live variables and to handle these, to handle the dynamicities of both stream attribute and also the route algebra. Uh, now, after we're giving some high level abstract, uh, instructions to the pieces, now we want to uh, show us how we can actually work with these abstractions. So now I give the workflow of Trident first. A network operator or the programmer has to specify the data schemas for network function states before, because if you don't know what it is, you cannot use it. And then the network functions must implement this schema so that they can correctly transport the information to the training system. And then a programmer can submit the network control uh, program to Trident and Trident will evaluate this program and calculate the corresponding routes for uh, with the information in hand, for example, maybe with some unknown uh, network function states at first. And after installing the flow rules, the packets start to go through the network functions and the network functions can update the state. And also, uh, the changes could come from uh, like configurations and also configuration changes and also the topology changes. And all these changes are handled by Trident in a unified way. And, uh, and then Trident checks whether the data plane configuration is consistent with the control plane state and automatically updates the routes if, uh, if necessary. So after giving the workflow, now we go into the details of each abstraction. The first ab uh, abstraction is called stream attribute. Stream attribute is based on the observation that different network function states are computed from different sets of packets. For example, if we consider an attribute called HTTP URI, because HTTP connections are basically carried out by TCP connections, so this information is computed from packets of the same TCP connection defined uh, by uh, TCP5 tuples. And for header detection, here we only consider the source address, then they are computed from uh, packets with the same I uh, source IP address. Now we give examples of how we can define a stream attribute. Uh, so we need the following information. First, you need to specify, okay, what type is uh, for this stream attribute. For example, the HTTP UI here, then it's always encoded as a string. And maybe for some, like uh, traffic volumes, they probably encode it as integers. And then we need a second parameter, basically a descriptive name to describe uh, so people can uh, understand what this attribute means. And eventually we have to also give the stream type. Basically, it's a bit masks on packet header fields specifying uh, what, how the set of packets are, uh, are composed to compute the network state. 
for example, they can be like just be five triple for HTTP UI information, source IP address, maybe for hitters, and maybe this IP address for some other attributes. And after we define the stream attribute, we can just use them directly, at, uh, just like a packet header field. And as we mentioned earlier, stream attribute can have an unknown value. And instead of, for example, in other Fugan languages, we probably handle them as null values or some other abstractions and try to choose unknown values as uh, basically their type and use plain strictly logic to select packets based on stream attributes. And below is an example of the choose table of the clean three value logic. And we also, uh, to simplify the handling of these three values, we also introduce some customized uh, control structures, both as language candies and to avoid ambiguity of the two-way branch. And now we introduce abstraction or, or algebra. So the objective of our algebra is to use well-structured declarative expressions to specify the construction of consistent and correlated routes. So this is motivated by prior studies such as waypoint-based routing and relation algebra. And uh, different from these approaches, we consider the basic unit of route algebra is a route set. So you can consider it's like uh, we are doing some uh, similar stuff to relation algebra. We're selecting the routes with certain conditions from a given route set. And that, I think that basically gives us a simpler understanding of how things are going. And then each route set has a network function indicator to indicate whether the traffic should uh, satisfy some uh, symmetry requirements of the given network functions. And we also have defined some operators to help uh, people uh, compose more complex route constructions. And now we give an example of how people might construct a desired route using route algebra. For example, uh, if, a, if a programmer wants to uh, define the route for flow from a host to a gateway with link capacity preferences. For example, they prefer higher uh, link capacities over the lower ones, for example. And for the first step is I want to compute a, a primary route set with a high link capacity. Basically, this can be expressed using a selection uh, uh, operator on top of the, the enumeration of all the routes in this network. And then we, d we can compute the backup route set with uh, like 10 gigabyte links. And now we have two uh, route sets. We can use the preference operators to combine them together. And uh, after that, because we are only considering the routing for a single flow, so we only need one of the routes from the route set. So we use uh, any operator to select a single route. And now we give some details about the live variable. So live variable, the objective of live variable is to make dependency tracking and updates transparent to programmers so that programmers only need to remember the abstraction of uh, stream attribute and route algebra and need not worry about the dynamicity caused by uh, the, the network programs. So, uh, live variable is motivated by functional reactive programming. So it is a traceable data type which not only stores the data and, but also the computation process. And stream attribute and route algebra are just high abstractions of live variables. And the update of live variables satisfy the gauge free consistency, which is a uh, important property in uh, uh, functional programming systems. And now we use an example to demonstrate how everything ties up together. We, uh, the example program blocks traffic for infected hosts and construct routes using a concatenation operator. So there could be multiple events. First, uh, for example, we consider the uh, typical case of topology change, and one of the routes becomes invalid, and using the route set, we, we might just pick another one from the same route set, and we can just, uh, the train system will automatically recompute the concatenation of these two new routes. And if the host status changes to infected, according to the program, the packet should be dropped. And when the host data is cleared, for example, through an admin interface or triggered by a timeout event, then basically it means we are back to a normal status, so we will start to fall in the path, and then the new route will be automatically recomputed. Uh, after giving the details of the, abstract, uh, the abstractions, now we uh, start to dive into some implement, implement, <laughs> implementation details. Uh, and one of the highlights in our paper is the efficient updates. Basically, it, uh, it gives 
uh, as the performance gains. And the objective is to leverage semantics of operators to achieve the fast updates. Because in, if we only use general like glitch-free consensus updates, then we still have to wait until all the computations are finished. But since we are uh, developing more like a domain-specific language for network uh, programming, so we can leverage the semantics of certain operators. For example, uh, in a, we, we consider the preference operator Basically, the pre preference operator works in the following way. If I have two, I have a route A and route B, and I prefer route A, so whenever A is available, I will not use route B. And we can dis uh, implement this uh, policy in this program. We first construct a primary path using the shortest path algorithm, and then we can construct a backup path using like unique protections. And uh, whenever a data change to the topology, which triggers the invalidation of both paths, so they are not available. We have to recompute them. And whenever the primary path is available, we don't have to wait for the backup path to be ready, and we can already use the primary path. And we use some, uh, we give a more detailed description of how everything works. And at the, at the time zero, because we don't have any route at the moment, and the, new, the shortest path is still in the calculation process, so we don't have any routes. And then, after the shortest path algorithm is finished, the primary route, P0, is ready. And with efficient update, we can already select P0 as the desired route. But if we use like glitch-free consistency as in traditional, uh, cons uh, in a general functional reactive systems, then they have, the system has to wait until the calculation of the backup route is finished. And that's what happens when, uh, at time two, the backup route P0 is also ready, then the standard update will select the P0 ASR. And we can see that even though, uh, after the time we, s we eventually select the same result, but uh, with efficient update, we can select, we can save some time. At, at time three, we consider a data change. For example, uh, for example, a topology change that invalidates primary route, but the backup route is still available. And at that time, because according to the uh, semantics of preference operator, we, uh, we just select B, the backup has B0 as the desired route. And at time four, when the second shortest path algorithm is finished and the P has a new value P1, and with efficient update, again, we can select P, P1 as R without waiting for the backup path to be uh, ready. So with this simple code, we can we demonstrate that Trident achieves a life cycle management for backup routes. And this is not just a example, a special case. Actually, we can also, in the, in the paper, we also uh, prove that for all route algebra operators, if the partial result has no unknown subsets, the output guarantees glitch free consistency and we can apply efficient updates. And now we go to some evaluation results. Uh, due to the time constraint, we only consider uh, two evaluations in the talk. So the first, uh, here is our evaluation settings. We build our prototype on top of a commodity server. And uh, we measure how difficult it is to integrate network functions into Trident by quantifying the, quantifying the efforts using the additional code. Uh, we consider two use cases. The first is a bro, a deep packet inspection framework, and the second is free radius, an open source radius server. And we in, uh, so we summarize the results in the table, and we can see that we, with tens of lines of code, we can already integrate these two network functions into Trident. And we also be, uh, demonstrate the benefit of efficient update using some micro benchmarks with the program we uh, demonstrated earlier. And we measure the recovery time for a single source and destination pair in four different topologies. Uh, we compare the results of the initial computation and also the fast rerolling stage, and we also compare the, st the time taken by the standard update method and the efficient update. And the results are given, uh, so the, top the results for these top topologies are listed in this page. And we can see that uh, the first bar of each graph represents the, uh, the, the ready time for the, to get a path uh, in using the standard uh, update method. And the second bar, is the time taken by 
efficient update way in, at the initial stage. And we can see that uh, we can actually reduce the time because we don't have to wait for the uh, backup pass calculation to finish. And for uh, the recover fast rerouting stage, uh, both approaches can reduce the time significantly, but because we have the backup, uh, because we use raw algebra to define the backup routes ahead of time, so they can be installed without waiting for the new shortest path to be ready. And we have demonstrated that uh, improvement up to 39% er, in initial computation and improvement of one to two magnitudes in the fast rerouting stage. Okay, to summarize the paper, China is a unified SDN framework with some novel abstractions, such as stream attribute, raw algebra, and live variables. And we are a bit able to achieve a more general internet network framework. Uh, right now, we are still limited to the write-only network functions in the sense that these network functions only update the state without, uh, to the trans system without reading it from, for example, the configurations from the uh, trans system, and we plan to expand the scope and uh, basically to more generic network functions. And also, we think with the uh, abstraction of live variables, it could also help people to verify the network policies behaviors. Okay, thank you for your attention. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Wenjifang from your lab. I have a question. A lot of traffic is encrypted, so you, how you handle the high-level tuples? Uh, that's a good question. So right now, we still rely on the capabilities of the network functions to handle, for example, the encrypted traffic. So if the network function is unable to, for example, uh, decrypt the traffic, then there's no way we can solve that problem. What are the limitations, or you know, is there anything that you found hard to understand this model? Yeah, at the moment, we th because we still, uh, you see, we, we uh, in the beginning, we just build everything from, from scratch, like using the raw sets, and then it might occur to people that, what if the raw set reprint, uh, returns an empty set, and it may not be efficient to enumerate all the routes, and then start to select routes from the raw set, and I think one, challenge is to whether we can do it in a more like top-down way we if we know what the uh, uh, the program specify okay I want some kind of routes and is it possible to generate the routes uh, in a top-down way I think basically I think th this is related to the efficiency of how you can uh, scale well with a lot of requirements because if you in, in, especially if you are in a very large topology so you can see that in, in our evaluation we still consider relatively small topology so that we can use the naive way and I think that's the problem. Yeah, thank you very much. So our next speaker is Nofel Yassin. He is just finishing his first year at Penn first year and he already has a sitcom paper and he is looking for internships this next coming year. He's gonna tell us about synchronized snapshots with a system called uh, Speedlight. Okay. Thank you, Justine. Uh, my name is Nofil Yassin and today I'm going to talk about why we need network-wide measurements and how we can get them. Measurements is how we answer questions about the network. Operators need for configuration, management, and provisioning. Architects need for new protocols and topologies. Res researchers need for measurement studies and evaluation. Today, how we conduct measurements is generally one of two ways. The first and most common approach in understanding network behavior is to measure individual network components directly. This can be in the form of counters, packet sampling, or, or even hardware-supported metrics. The other method is to move beyond single component measure and use end-to-end -end or path-level tools. 
Uh, examples of this include ping, n-band network telemetry, or ACN. Both of these techniques have enabled us to solve many challenges over the years. However, there is a large class of questions they still can't answer. I'll give you a simple example. Imagine we have a small topology with four switches A, B, X, Y. As you can see, it is an asymmetric, topo asymmetric topology as there is a missing link. Now imagine we observe a packet traveling from B to Y and then, and then getting dropped. What is the reason for this packet drop? Well, there are a few possibilities. One possibility is that the drop is due to congestion. Uh, in, in this case, the both the queues at the queue at X and the queue at Y are full, and therefore the drop was unavoidable. Uh, we could have only prevented a drop if we if we add capacity to the network. Another possibility is uh, our road balancing protocol uh, made the wrong decision. In this case, the queue at X has additional capacity, uh, but A is sending data to Y anyway. This may indicate a problem with the load balancing protocol. Uh, these two cases are both possible explanation. Uh, if we were able to measure both queues simultaneously, we would have been able to distinguish between them. Unfortunately, modern tools don't have this ability. Uh, tools that measure individual devices uh, may be able to show you the, the, the Y has full queue or X, or X has a full queue or an empty queue, uh, but cannot say whether those, occurs, whether those states occur at the same time. Particularly in the case of Bell Street traffic, and recent papers have shown that in modern large and fast networks, bursts occur in microsecond scale. We can also measure an uh, entire path, uh, for example, by tracing the state from A to Y or A to X, uh, but, but, but the problem is they cannot tell us the state simultaneously. Uh, the, the, the key observation we make in this paper is if you can take one thing from this talk, it should be that existing tools fail to capture simultaneous behavior. So how do we get this uh, type of global view of the network? Ideally, we would like to capture the entire state of the network at a single point of time. Unfortunately, such strict consistency is impossible without atomic clocks or freezing the network. Instead, uh, we aim, uh, instead, we aim to have a set of data plane measurements that capture the state of the network at an approximately single point of time. We do this by providing two key properties. The first is causal consistency. Causal consistency, mean, causal consistency means if a measurement includes the effect of a particular event, then all events that led to that particular event should also be included. Causal consistency is necessary, so our set of measurements actually makes sense. The second is near synchrony. Near synchrony means to have an upper bound when, when the time is the time difference between the when we record the last component in the network and the first component in the network. Ideally, we would like to be, to be less than RTT, so our captured state is actually close to the actual state. Together, these two properties preserve the most useful metric. Okay. To meet this goal, we implemented and deployed Speedlight uh, in P4 switches. Speedlight captures network-wide state, or in other words, takes the snapshot of the network. This state could be any data network admin wants to record and is supported by the P4 program. A speedlight is designed to operate even if the subset of the switches are running speedlight. Our results show that the synchronization is less than 100 microsecond, which is even for large networks, which is within the RTT of, of most LANs. Before I move on, uh, let me give you outline of the talk. First, I'm going to talk about a classic algorithm that forms the base of our system, the Chandy Lambert snapshot algorithm. Then the challenges of taking snapshots in the network. Then I will describe protocol and the prototype implementation. Finally, there is evaluation in which I will show that we were able to complete the snapshot more than a magnitude faster than the current mechanism and some interesting insights about data center workloads. So let's talk. So, so first, let's talk about wha what it means to have a global view of the network. One way is to get local state of every node. In distributed system, we call the collection of local states a cut. A cut partitions the network into pre and post snapshots. Let's say we make a cut, and we get something like this. This cut is in inconsistent because we see that the server B local state shows a packet received, but according to this cut, no machine in the system has sent the, the packet. 
instead what we want is a consistent cut something like this a consistent cut is defined as, as the state of the network captured such that no effect is seen without its cause Shandy Lampert is a classic algorithm that determines the state of a distributed system during con computation by making consistent cuts. It is completely asynchronous at, and it ensures causal consistency. Uh, now let me walk you through how Shandy Lampert algorithm works. Um, let's say we have three servers A, B, C, uh, and we want to take its snapshots. Uh, our messages carry the snapshot number. When we initiate the snapshot, the observer process, the process that taking the snapshot saves its own local state, marked by a star, sends the snapshot message to all other processes, and starts recording. When the process receiving the new snapshot ID for the first time, it saves its own local state, and, and then attaches the new snapshot ID to all the subsequent messages, and also starts recording at other channels. The snapshots are completed when servers have received snapshot token from all other neighbors, uh, marked by a circle. If during the recording phase there are any packets between the star and the circle, they're considered part of the channel state. Shandy uh, Lampert is a nice starting place because it was designed for distributed system. However, enhancing it to a switch level poses multiple challenges. First, and one of the biggest criticism of Shandy Lampert is it does not have an upper bound when the network wire snapshot will be captured. As it, it is asynchronous, uh, it can take a long time, and we want something close to an actual state. Second, Shandy Lampert also assumes that the nodes are single-threaded and have FIFO channels, whereas modern networks are highly parallel. Each, each port in the switch essentially can process at the same time. Third, Shandy Lampert assumes general-purpose CPUs, and programmable data planes have very limited computing power. Sending packets to the control plane is no better than sending packets to a remote host, as they both incur overhead, and it breaks both of our desired property, properties, causal consistency and near synchrony. Now I will tell you solutions for these challenges, and along the way, we are going to learn how Speedlight works. First, uh, let me introduce to the various components in our system. Consider small, small, small cloud. Uh, we have an observer system under network admin and a small topology with five switches. Uh, each switch has its own control plane and data plane. Our first challenge was that Chandy Lampert have no upper bound when the snapshot will be completed. To resolve this, uh, we do two things. First, we synchronize time and we enlist every switch to start the snapshot together. Before taking the snapshots, we synchronize routers using precision time protocol or PTP for short. It is not perfect but does a good job to synchronize clock in microseconds. Snapshots can be initiated at any switch in the system. So we start the snapshot at multiple switches in the system, and an algorithm will still be correct. The proof is given in the paper. Initiation is as simple as sending a packet to some port in the network with an incremented snapshot ID. A snapshot ID is piggybacked on regular traffic, but the control plane has the option to send null messages with, a, with an updated snapshot ID. So we schedule a snapshot number n at time t at all the switches in the system. At time t, the control plan then sends the packet to the ASIC with the incremented snapshot ID. As all the switches start the snapshot at approximately at the same time, it gives us a very tight upper bound. Uh, our second challenge was that Chandy Lambert assumes single-threaded channels and FIFO single-threaded CPU and FIFO channels. However, modern switches are highly parallel. They can process multiple packets at the same time. A naive implementation will fail us to provide causal consistency. To resolve this, uh, we break down the network into its most fundamental components. Here you see we divide the data plane into ports into two components. We separate out the ingress and the egress. The red and the blue lines in the diagram shows queues for different class of services. Despite aggressive amounts of parallelism, for a single port, single direction, processing is guaranteed to be linearizable. This breaks down the challenge of parallel processing and priority. As I mentioned in the last slide, CPU, CPU sends the increment snapshot ID to the data plane. When these packets arrive at the data plane, each port records in own state and then piggybacks the new snapshot ID to all the packets, to all the packets it forwards, regardless of the destination. 
an issue might be what if the new snapshot id from the cpu does not reach the data plane or it is delayed in this case each port will take the take the snapshot when it receives the packet with the new snapshot id from the neighboring switch essentially if the packet contains a new snapshot id it does not matter whether it receives from the neighboring switch or the control plane the use of snapshot information in the packet header also makes it resilient to packet drop our third channel ch challenge was candy lambert assumes general general purpose cpu programmable data planes have limited computing power they have limited programming model space and number of ram access at line rate this makes it difficult to complete the snapshot and handle many edge cases for example lack of traffic where ports don't see update from the neighbors control plane is responsible for compensating for these deficiencies for completing snapshot using control planes we need to answer two questions how does the control plane know when the snapshot is completed and how to collect the snapshot data in chandel lampard we know the snapshot is completed when a server receives the latest snapshot id from all the all the neighbors the case is similar in speedlight a port has completed a snapshot when the when it has received the latest snap, snapshot id from its upstream neighbor to propagate this snapshot to the control plane data plane sends notifications to the control plane and can detect completion of snapshot looking at the notifications control plane can detect completion of snapshot once the snapshot is completed control plane can simply read the data directly from the ram lack of traffic can make snapshot inconsistent as some port will not be able to, will, will not be able to complete in this case we force the snapshot through broadcast there's also a possibility of some port of link going down or notifications being dropped where we are unable to complete the snapshot let's say some port goes down um, and then we see a snapshot id jumping from 5 to 10 in this case we conservatively mark the snapshot ids as 6 to 9 as inconsistent handling such, such cases we end up with a bipartite design data plane is responsible for core of the protocol the processing required in band whereas the whereas the control plane is responsible to fill in the gaps now let's come to the uh, implementation we implemented a prototype of speed lights including all of the control plane and data plane in barefoot to fino switches for evaluation uh, there are several questions to be answered here how well does it synchronize what is the overhead and what it can show about us the network as shown in the picture we had only one hardware p4 switch uh, and to faithfully emulate a large network we sliced the hardware switch into four independent virtual switches having a shared cpu among the virtual control planes creates a bias in synchronization time because having the same processor means virtual control planes were also sharing the same clock and our goal is to minimize the synchronization time therefore such bias one was unacceptable in the same clock in the in the experiment to handle this bias we move the virtual control planes to external machine this technique provides isolation among virtual control planes and make them completely independent this gives us a small leap in topology with four switches uh, and six servers we began by evaluating synchronization properties of speed light this exper this experiment captures how long do does it take for speed light to capture the state of the network we schedule a snapshot at virtual control planes at time t specified in microseconds the virtual control plane sends initiation packet to all the ports in the switch we then compute the synchronization time by taking the time difference between the earliest and the latest time stamp across all ports for comparison we also measure the time difference for a typical for a typical counter polling framework similar to modern systems when observer polls statistics from each port individually we are control plane agent that reads and returns the value on demand on median it takes us only 6.4 microseconds to capture the state of the network whereas per polling uh, it takes a few magnitude higher at around 3500 microseconds next we evaluate how speed light scales for this experiment uh, we ran a similar experiment with the previous one but over a large simulated topology and using 64 port routers the figure av shows average whole network synchronization time our simulation includes ptp time drift open network linux scheduling effects and the latency between initiation and completion of snapshot 
we note that speed light initiate at every switch. Additional routers have limit. Additional routers have limited effect. How however, additional ports and router can can make encountering tail effects more likely. This effect still remains typically under RTTs. There are few overheads involved in the network when we implement a speed light. SP, SP4 switches compute at line rate. We do not add any latency. Our additional header in the packet take eight bytes per packet. However, we use 16 bits per integer. If an operator can work with fewer bits, uh, it will take much smaller. We use 24 stateless and 11 stateful ALUs. This is out of 384 and 48 respectively. However, traditional switches are, are constrained by memory or by CPU. We have a low memory overhead. To, sa to save one, sna one snapshot of all ports in the switch, it takes few kilobytes depending on the metric that we are measuring. These resources are for 100 snapshots saved in the data plane at one time and also include the forwarding rules of our small forwarding topo small topology. These numbers are just for reference. We can make we can we, we can take more or less memory or CPU depending on the number of snapshots and the metric that we are measuring. For instance, we comp compiled a version that uses 17 stateless and 9 state stateful ALUs. It depends on the metric and the what network admins want to capture. So the, let's come to the use cases. The first use case we target is detection of synchronized application traffic pattern. For this experiment, we measured weighted moving average of packet weights at all egress ports. We take 100 snapshots at one second interval and then calculated the pairwise correlation between, be, between the ports using experiment test. To read the graph, I'll give you a simple example. Let's say we are reading correlation between port 1 and port 9. These boxes are color coded in speedlight snapshots. We see a high correlation as the value is close to one. In, po in the polling mechanism, we, we, have vision, we, we have no correlation as the value close to zero. So overall, uh, the experiment test found for, for speed light, we have 43% higher correlation. To validate the correctness, we analyzed the output evidence of two ground truths related to the application traffic and network topology. First, we expected to see no significant correlation between port zero uh, because it is a master server and did not participate in the computation. The second is we expected to find high correlation between possible ECMP next hops. With a snapshot, the correlation coefficients match both expected ground truths. Polling, on the other hand, failed to identify the positive correlation between ECMP ports. As shown by the red boxes, the cor correlation found with polling were either statistically insignificant or worse, statically significant but negative. The goal behind this experiment is to show that snapshots can reveal ground truths to us and help debug applications or opt optimize network protocols. Uh, now let's move to the second, second use case. So we evaluate, uh, is my load balancing protocol working? We demonstrate speed light's ability to answer this question by comparing performance characteristics of ECMP and flow light. In theory, flow light should should balance more fairly because it splits on traffic bursts rather than pa packet floats li like ECMP. To measure this, we computed standard deviation of weighted moving average of packet enter arrival times across the uplink ports. Uh, based on the measurement from speed light, we see a few effects. In the Hadoop workload, we see that polling is unable to differentiate between ECMP and flowlet, whereas in reality, there is a difference. Next, for memcache, we see, note that for memcache, the units are in microseconds. We see that ma the, so memcache is consistently very balanced because the flows are extremely short and our workloads were relatively balanced. We see that polling consistently overestimates the balance. Averaging over long periods shows a perfect balance in both cases. And together, these two experiments show that polling might not just provide an incorrect view of the network, but also difficult to put a bound on the inaccuracy. Let me summarize everything. We demonstrate that it is possible to take high resolution network wide snapshots with programmable data planes, which gives us causal consistency and the entire network state can be recorded in less than 100 microseconds. We have implemented it on P4 switches and we have released our code on this link. Thank you. Any questions or comments?
Any questions? So I was wondering if you could share some more use cases. I mean, this is clearly a really novel primitive. I've never seen something like it. It's super cool. But what else could we use it for besides the examples you uh, gave us? So one thing that I was thinking, like like Sonata was implemented, they have a query-driven language. So they needed, they actually needed talked about having network-wide events. I think this can be used there also. This is one example. Cool. Uh, hi, Miguel Neves from UFRGS in Brazil. Uh, which type of metrics are you able to collect from uh, your network, and how do programmers specify them? Ah, uh, so that so so we can program in a P. So the, if we, if our metric is supported by the P4 program, we just have to point it in the direction of the of our code, and it can capture it. So we tried it for Q Q Q DAP utilization, packet counters. These are something that we have tried. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. We buy from the Microsoft Nest Talk. So together with network snapshot, I actually have a very simple solution. So I can use PTP to synchronize the time of, of the switch CPU. Ah. And then I when I put a counter, I also record the timestamp. Ah. So what is the advantage of your scheme compared to my simple okay. heuristic? OK, so it, it will not give us causal consistency. And we have causal consistency. And it, and it does not record channel states. And we have channel states. OK, I see. Thank you. Let's thank Nafil and all of our speakers, and then we'll see all of you back at 11.